what is going on everybody? Nick Heron here back with some more fantasy football facts for today. Guys, today what I'm going to be giving you is my top 10 running back rankings for the 2017 fantasy football season. This is for PPR scoring. If you guys are looking for standard scoring, I will be doing an additional video on this. Also, be sure to check in the video description below. There's a list to my full cheat sheet. It has uh, every position on it, including PPR, non-PPR. So you guys can go check that one out. It's a Google spreadsheet. Very easy to access, very easy to use. Uh, if you guys do enjoy this video at any time, be sure to hit that like button and of course subscribe to the channel if you are new as well. I will be giving you guys plenty of fantasy football content throughout the season. So let's get right into it, guys. The first thing that I do want to point out is a couple of guys who are not on this list today, notable guys, but I, ones that I do want to point out. First of all, Danny Woodhead is somebody who has been a running back one before in, t in the uh, PPR scoring formats. He's going to a Baltimore offense that loves to throw the football to running backs. So this is a perfect match for him. I think he's going to do very, very well this year. Would not be surprised to have him finish in the top 15 at the position, uh, but he is definitely a great asset to have as like an RB2 in fantasy football this season. So uh, you can actually draft him a lot of times as an RB3. So that, that's very, very good. Definitely go ahead and check him out. Uh, big time value, especially in home leagues. Second guy, Todd Gurley does just miss my top 10. This whole situation is in uh, Los Angeles. I almost said St. Louis. Los Angeles is still just kind of a crap show. I mean, there's really not a whole lot to be excited about, to be completely honest with you. Uh, Todd Gurley is probably the best guy on the team, of course, for fantasy purposes. But what does that really mean? We don't know at this point. I've, I've talked highly of him before as far as his skills go, but uh, you know, it, it's just going to be tough, man. There's not going to be a lot of opportunities there. He's not a big time pass catcher or anything like that. Um, and I do think he's going to struggle to get into the end zone because that LA offense is probably going to be pretty bad. Another guy that I want to point out that does have additional value in PPR formats is Ty Montgomery of the Green Bay Packers. He may not finish as an RB1, but he's a guy that's going to give you a high floor on a week-to-week -week basis, especially early in the season. Catches a ton of passes, of course, a former wide receiver, so he is certainly somebody that can do some serious damage in the passing game. So let's move on and talk about the top 10 now. Starting off at number 10, we have a rookie. Yes, a rookie. I know that's ridiculous, but this is the days that we live in in fantasy football, folks. And we've got Dalvin Cook of the Minnesota Vikings. This is a guy who I'm noticeably higher on than the majority of the rest of the industry right now. I think that he's got a lot of talent. and He's really stepping into what I believe to be a good situation, to be honest with you. The Vikings drafted him at number 41 overall. This was their first draft pick of the 2017 NFL draft. They didn't have a first round pick. So they took him early in the second round, which really tells me that they want to make him a focal point of the team. And honestly, I don't really see any reason why he's not going to be. A lot of people seem to think that Latavius Murray is still going to be the starter for some reason, but this guy hasn't practiced. I mean, and not on any sort of full basis or anything like that anyway. So Dalvin Cook's getting the full time working with that first team and it's really putting Latavius Murray behind the eight ball as far as getting on the field. So I don't see any reason why Dalvin Cook isn't the guy to own here. And honestly, the talent just tells me that Dalvin Cook should be the guy to own anyway. Cook did play 18 snaps in the Vikings' first preseason game, so that is something to pay attention to. He had four catches and ran 12 routes on those 18 plays, and he also had five carries. So that tells you he was only out there to pass protect one time, and honestly, though, the team has been ranting about how good he is in pass protection, so that should allow him to get onto the field plenty, and he should do a good job uh, for your PPR leagues as well. I'm actually pretty high on him. Moving on to number nine, we have Ezekiel Elliott, who's probably the most polarizing player in fantasy football right now. A lot of people have him like as like a sixth round pick, and then other people still have him as a late first round pick. Like it could be anywhere in between that. But someone in your league is going to be drafting Ezekiel Elliott, I would say probably before the end of the second round in almost every single fantasy football draft. Somebody's gonna be willing to take that chance. And I don't see any reason why you shouldn't, to be honest with you. Um, you know, obviously you're gonna have to make sure that you that you back him up with other talent. He's going to be suspended for six games, most likely. The appeal isn't going to be going in until August 29th, which is after most fantasy football drafts, so we won't really get good information regarding if he actually is going to be suspended the first six games. So we do have to kind of assume that he is going to be suspended that long. Uh, but anyway, even if he is suspended for six games, just go ahead and draft heavily on running backs. Get some good guys de deep depth guys. Get like a Frank Gore. Get yourself a, uh, you know, a Jonathan Stewart even. Some of these boring guys, Darren McFadden is the obvious one, of course. The backup for Ezekiel Elliott, the, the perceived backup anyway. I guess we don't know that for a fact, but our, Darren McFadden definitely has the talent, and in this Dallas offense, there's no reason why he can't be an RB2 while Ezekiel Elliott's out. 
So if you get he and Elliott, you're going to, I think, be in a good situation. You'll get that RB2 value for the first six weeks of the season. The Cowboys will then have their bye. Of course, everybody's talking about that. And then Ezekiel Elliott will be back to help you out in that second half of the season. He should be an RB1 down the stretch. I don't see any reason why he won't be. He'll be extremely uh, healthy, if nothing else, down the stretch. So that's obviously pretty helpful as well. He is a big risk, but I do think he could be a game changer and a league winner potentially down the stretch. So don't sleep on Ezekiel Elliott. Don't be the guy that refuses to take him for any reason at all just because he's going to be out six games. Yeah, you don't want that. It's not an ideal situation. But at the same time, though, if you get yourself an additional guy in there that can still contribute like a Darren McFadden, I still think Ezekiel Elliott's going to be worth that pick. Going up from there, number eight, Jordan Howard of the Chicago Bears. Fellow L... Uh, Fellow rookie to Ezekiel Elliott this past year, and Elliott, of course, did lead the NFL in rushing, but Jordan Howard was in second. Granted, it was a distant second, but still, he was the second highest rushing leader in the NFL as a rookie. Keep that in mind, guys. Don't sleep on it, Jordan Howard. And he is the unquestioned starter going into his second season. Uh, the, the team, the Chicago Bears, still have one of the best offensive lines in football, so I don't see any reason why the the situation is going to change substantially. The only real differences in Chicago's offense is that they lost Alshon Jeffrey and Jay Cutler, which to me means that they're going to probably lean on the run a little more heavily. Granted, they might not have as good of an offense overall, so his touch, touchdown upside might be a little bit capped, but I do think they're going to lean a little more heavily on him, which should give him the ball more, and he should be able to produce because of that. At number seven, we have Jay Ajayi, he, who did finish as an RB1 in 2016, despite the fact that he was completely inactive in week one. This is a guy who had to work his way into starting time, and he did a great job, and obviously he had three huge games last year, three 200-yard performances in 2016. He's not a big pass catcher. He did only catch 27 passes, so that's why he's not higher up on this list right now. Uh, he is a little bit better in standard scoring leagues, I will admit that, but still at number seven, I believe that he is a very solid RB1, and like Jordan Howard before him, He's one of the few quote-unquote bell cow running backs that we have left in the NFL right now. A lot of people are still in, uh, a lot of offenses are still in like these shared backfields, and Jay Jai really shouldn't have to worry about that too much. Yeah, there will be a couple other guys that will come in and spell him from time to time on passing downs, but for the most part, he's going to be out there probably 70-80% of the snaps, which is good enough to be a very good fantasy contributor. At number six, we have DeMarco Murray, who definitely enjoyed a career resurgence in, resurgence in Tennessee this past year after struggling in Philadelphia. He is going to be running behind, again, maybe one of the best offensive lines in the league. Another year for them to gel. They should be even better than they were last year, and they were elite last year in Tennessee. He's always been a good pass catcher, even in Philadelphia, honestly. He's catching 50 or more passes a season for the most part. And he probably has top three upside as a running back. The only issue is that Derrick Henry is on the roster. So as long as Derrick Henry's out there, there's always going to be the concern, of course, that Henry's going to come in and get, you know, 25, 35% of the carries and snaps and things like that, which would certainly limit DeMarco Murray's upside. But... As far as fantasy production goes, I mean, there's plenty to go around in Tennessee, so I don't see any reason why he couldn't still produce, even if he does only get 65 to 70% of the touches out of that Tennessee backfield. He should still be an RB1 so long as he stays healthy. At number five, I've got a guy who I'm pretty damn high on right now, and that is Melvin Gordon, who shot into fantasy stardom in 2016. He fell three yards short of 1,000 yards, but he didn't play every game either, so he definitely would have gotten to it if he did play every game this past season. But he also had 419 receiving yards. So that's something that you're not going to get out of a lot of guys who are that we've just talked about with, you know, like the Jay Ajayis and uh, like the, uh, let's see here, the Jordan Howards, those type of guys just... They don't catch a ton of passes. Melvin Gordon can do that in addition to being a very good runner. He also scored 12 touchdowns in his sophomore year after scoring zero as a rookie, which is kind of odd. But I think the Chargers offense is going to be improved overall this season. I like his touchdown upside. I think he's a dark horse to lead all running backs in touchdowns, honestly, this season. I do really think San Diego's offense is going to be substantially better with that passing game improving. And that should give him more opportunities closer to the goal line to get into the end zone, which is obviously very good. Another thing to keep in mind is that Melvin Gordon did catch four passes in eight of his 13 games. So that is pretty damn impressive. He's somebody that's given you a high floor on a week-to-week -week basis, and we definitely love that in fantasy football. LaShawn McCoy is my number four running back this year. He continues to put up big numbers. Now, obviously, moving Sammy Watkins off of the team doesn't help with moving back safeties and things like that. It's not going to be great as far as that goes, and it 
but the the positive is that it could mean that the team does rely a little bit more on LaShawn McCoy, even in the passing game, which I think is a big benefit. McCoy has always been a good pass catcher as a running back, just like DeMarco Murray catching 40, 50, 60 passes a season. He's even had a couple where he's been up towards 80. So I don't think that's going to happen, but I do think that 50 is pretty well in the realm of possibilities, and really there's not a whole lot of other guys out there to contend with him as far as carries in Buffalo, so I don't really see a whole lot of concern for him to not have good fantasy numbers as long as he stays healthy. The concerns are that his carries are piling up. Of course, he's almost at 2,300 total touches over his career, but I still think he has one of the highest floors at his position, so that's why he's ranked number three for me, or number four, excuse me. Number three is Devonta Freeman of the Atlanta Falcons, who was actually the top scoring fantasy running back in 2015, and he was utilized a little bit less in 2016, and of course there were other players like uh, David Johnson and Le'Veon Bell and those type of guys that had monster seasons in 2016, so unfortunately he didn't finish as high as he did the previous year, but he was still very, very productive in 2016, still finished with more than 1,500 total yards and 13 total touchdowns, which is just absolutely money. He's caught 50 or more passes in back-to-back seasons now and even when he wasn't utilized as much in the running game as a rookie he was still catching a bunch of passes so we know that's in his skill set of course most people have the worry that Tevin Coleman is going to come in and start to take a big workload from him, but I don't think that's going to happen. Devonta Freeman did just sign a big contract with the Falcons, and I don't think they're going to go away from him. And not only that, but I do think he's the more talented running back of the two, so I don't see any real reason why Tevin Coleman's going to step in and get more than what he did in 2016 anyway, as far as touches go. Moving on to number two, Le'Veon Bell. And honestly, he and my number one could pretty much be both number one or number two. Like, they're interchangeable. 1A, 1B is more like it. Le'Veon Bell's 16-game pace in 2016 was 1,690 rushing yards and nine touchdowns. He was also on pace, if you would have played every game and not been suspended, 100 catches, 821 yards, and two or three touchdowns. That's absolutely ridiculous. Those are like Julian Edelman receiving numbers almost, in addition to elite rushing numbers. Like, this guy is out of control good, seriously. Le'Veon Bell is an absolute beast. He does have some injury concerns as he has missed some time in the past, but he is an absolute superstar. The other thing, of course, is those suspensions. He's one weed smoke away from getting in some serious trouble and potentially missing the rest of the season, so that's never a good thing, of course. Um, But he is an absolute superstar, like I said, when he's healthy and he's on the field. Still in a great offense in Pittsburgh. They're still going to be very, very good unless something really crazy happens. And there's really no reason why Le'Veon Bell won't continue to be elite. I still think he's worthy of being the number one overall pick if you want to take him there. I do have him at number two. But I would just say don't let him slip past number two in really any scoring format. The only formats that I can see where he shouldn't be number two are basically formats where you get negative points for rushing yardage or negative points for receptions or something just ridiculous like that. Other than that, Le'Veon Bell needs to be the number two or number one overall pick. So let's talk about my number one, who is David Johnson, who was also the top scoring running back in 2016. He scored a whopping 20 touchdowns as uh, in, I believe it was his second year, which is absolutely ridiculous, guys. He led all running backs with 80 receptions. Now, granted, Le'Veon Bell would have had more than 80 receptions if he had not been suspended. But still, you have to keep in mind, guys. David Johnson, is his overall usage is absolutely off the charts. This is a guy who is a fantasy beast, my friend, seriously. I do have him, like I said, ranked slightly ahead of Le'Veon Bell just because I think his touch, touchdown upside is a little bit higher. Bell has never scored more than 11 total touchdowns in a season, whereas David Johnson this past year scored 20. So, you know, that is a big differentiator if he can get back up there. I would expect that those touchdowns move down just a little bit more towards like the 15-16 range potentially. But still, that is plenty enough that he should be the number one overall player in my personal opinion in, again, practically any format, even in two quarterback formats. So that is going to do it, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. Again, I do have my full rankings listed in the description, so go check that Google spreadsheet out. Drop a like and subscribe to the channel if you can, and be sure to follow me on Twitter at ClickwithTV. Thanks again, guys, and I will see you next time on Fantasy Football Facts.